All right, we got our next installment of our Kingdom series here, and I've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just going to jump right into the passage without a lot of setup or review or any of that kind of stuff. So I hope you guys are ready. I'm in Matthew 11, and we're going to set the stage for the next few um, references to the Kingdom of Heaven and the Kingdom of God that Jesus makes. It's kind of one of my favorite little sections and stories to go over, okay? So here we go. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. So again, Jesus says, again, finding himself centered in the kind of the epicenter of religiosity, Jewish religious spiritual devotion, the Phariseeville, that location. When John, referring to John the Baptist, who was in prison, so John is in prison, when he heard about the deeds of the Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect something else? Should we expect someone else? So when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of Messiah, which makes me wonder, what did he just hear? In my mind, the last story that we just talked about in the last episode, two stories prior to this story in Matthew, one of the last things that's just happened is Jesus has just healed a Roman centurion's uh, servant, if you remember. And my teacher said that he thinks John the Baptist is provoked by this. If you study the theology and the preaching of John the Baptist, it's clear that John holds to what was the really popular um, eschatology, the, the theology of the end times in his day. In Second Temple Judaism, eschatology means the study of the end times. Where is it all going? How is it going to end? And in the Jewish world of Jesus, the popular worldview is what we're going to call two-part eschatology. I'm going to put all kinds of extra links in the description of this video so you can go listen to more of our stuff and learn some more and get deeper on some of that if you want to. But there was what was called two-part eschatology. And what that means is that in the Jewish world, they understood two different ages. There's an age of this world and there's the age to come. There's the broken world, the world as it is, the world that's screwed up, that this age, they called it Olam Chazah. Olam Chazah, this age, and then there's the world to come. It's the world as it should be. It's the world restored. It's eternal life. It's a, so there's this age and the age to come. There's Olam Chazah, and then there's what they called Olam Chava. Olam Chazah and Olam Chava, this age and the age to come. And two-part eschatology believed that we lived in this age, right? There was this age, but then... Messiah was going to come, there would be judgment, it would, the Messiah would judge this age, get rid of all the bad stuff, and would usher in the age to come. Two parts. We live in this age, the Messiah is going to bring the age to come. The Messiah will render judgment and then we'll be left with the age to come. Two ages, two-part eschatology. And it was the popular opinion. And you can see why. Like if you're living under Roman oppression, you want rescue. You want to be delivered. You want a clean break between this age and the age to come. That was the popular theology. John the Baptist clearly holds to this, by the way. When you listen to his teaching, he says, The axe is at the root of the tree. And God's about ready to chop down the tree and throw it into the fire. Um, he says God is standing at his threshing floor. And this is a condemnation on the temple and the temple system, the corrupt temple system, because the temple was built on a threshing floor. And so John the Baptist said in the Gospels, he said, God is standing at his threshing floor and the winnowing fork is in his hand. He's about ready to thresh his grain. And that's this message of judgment upon the temple. John has a message of judgment. He said, God is going to baptize you in fire, right? John is saying judgment is coming. Two-part eschatology. We live in this world. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is hand because judgment is coming and, and Messiah is going to usher in the age to come. Two-part. The other theology is what we might call three-part eschatology. So you still have the age, this age and the age to come, but instead of two parts, they overlap. And so in three-part eschatology, what you have is you have this age, this broken world, this world that's kind of screwed up, 
And then there's a forerunner, somebody who comes and prepares the way for Messiah, and Messiah comes and brings in the age to come. Messiah comes and ushers in the age to come, but this age does not do away with, the age to come does not do away with this age. They coexist together. And then later, at some later date, God gets rid of this age, and the only thing you're left with is the age to come. But instead of two parts with a clean break, you have three parts where there was part A, just this age. There's part B, the two ages together. And then there's part C, where there's just the age to come. Three-part eschatology. And Jesus, if you listen to his teaching, very clearly holds to three-part eschatology. He talks about the weeds and the wheat growing together. He talks about the kingdom of God being planted like a seed and the kingdom of God being here and now and among you. He very clearly has an understanding that he has brought in and ushered in the kingdom of God and these two ages coexist. But what this means is that John the Baptist and Jesus have a fundamental disagreement with how their theology works. And so John sends word to Jesus because it's a weird question, right? Doesn't John the Baptist know who Jesus is? Doesn't he know? And it seems like he's having this crisis of, are you the Messiah? I don't know if you're the Messiah. And you're like, why is he asking that? He's been saying the whole time that Jesus is Messiah. I don't think John is actually asking the question. I think John is kind of poking at Jesus, saying, Jesus, I've heard that you're healing centur Roman centurion servants. Like, are, are you helping the Romans? That's not what Messiah is supposed to do. Are you the Messiah or not? Because you need to get on with it and start acting like the Messiah. So I think John is saying, Jesus, are you the Messiah or not? Should we be looking for somebody else? Start acting like the Messiah. This is how Jesus responds. Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. Which is a weird statement at the end, right? What is that all about? Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me, right? Okay. So Jesus' response to John's disciples is, go back and tell John what you see in here. And then Jesus quotes a few different passages, probably all of them out of Isaiah. Some have suggested a couple other places. But probably out of Isaiah, places like Isaiah 32 or Isaiah 35. Let me actually quote to you Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah 35. Probably one of the best options here for what Jesus is probably quoting. Isaiah 35 says this. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame will leap like a deer, and the, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So Jesus appears to clearly be quoting Isaiah, and then he tags onto that a clear quotation from Isaiah 61. One of his favorite verses, Jesus loves to reference this verse. Uh, he identifies with his, his mission with this verse. It says this, the Lord... The, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. That's the word for Messiah, by the way. Messiah, Mashiach, is anointed one. The Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So Jesus quotes Isaiah 35 and then quotes Isaiah 61, but stops quoting right when he's about to... And John the Baptist is going to know this. John the Baptist is going to have his Isaiah memorized. And he's going to know what comes next. And Jesus does not quote it. Listen to what comes next. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance for our God, to comfort all who mourn. So Jesus says, John, I am the Messiah, and I'm doing the works of Messiah, and I'm here to, play, to, 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 to bring good news, to proclaim good news to the poor. Whereas John, he's in prison. And Jesus stops his quotation and sa essentially telling him, but you're going to die in prison. 
And I'm here to do all these things that Messiah is here to do, but rescuing you from your captivity and your prison is not one of them. I'm not here to bring the vengeance that you think is coming. John, your theology is a little off, and I'm sorry. Blessed is the one who does not stumble on account of me. John, your theology is wrong, but keep the faith. Now, I think everybody listening to Jesus at this point would have been like, whoa, Jesus just told John. Like Jesus and John just had a little disagreement and he just told him, man, can you believe that? Jesus is spitting bars, man. And, and I think Jesus knows that and his response is deliberate and direct. Listen to what John says, or what, listen to what Jesus says on the heels of this. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about him, about John. So I think Jesus is saying this so that John's disciples can hear this as they leave. Because John has just said, Jesus has just said to John, your, es your, your eschatology, your theology is wrong, John, but I still love you. Keep the faith. And now he doubles down on this. Listen to what he says. What did you go out to the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? Jesus says, why are you out here? Like, what is it that captivated you about John? Do you think John is just going to like change his mind about stuff? Do you know how committed, how convicted, how passionate John is about his theology? Of course. Of course you know that. It's why you come out here to listen to him. His conviction and his fire and his preaching. Uh, and yeah, John has his theology wrong. And yet he's, he's fired up about it. And that's what you love about him. Did you come out here because you think he was swayed by the wind? Of course not. A man dressed in fine clothes? Did you come out here to see a man dressed in fine clothes? Of course not. That's not who John the Baptist is. You didn't come out here because this was easy listening, because it looked good. You came out here because John was confronting the stuff that you know is wrong in this world. And his theology may be off, but his ministry was beautiful, Jesus says. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, and I tell you more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So Jesus says, why did you come out here? Did you come out here because John was like soft and gentle and easy to listen to? No, you came out here because John was a prophet. And he's not just a prophet, Jesus said. He is the prophet, the one who was foretold in Malachi chapter 4, who was going to come and prepare the way for me, Messiah. John's not just anybody. John's not just a great preacher. He's not just a great prophet. He is the prophet that God sent to prepare the way. I think Jesus is a little fired up here. Like, I just told John his theology is wrong, but don't think for a moment that John is not great. Listen to what he says. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, there has not been anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven has this upside down, inside out, greatest is least, least is greatest. And yet of those people born of women, John is, a, John is the greatest amongst them. John is the greatest amongst them. Jesus says, don't doubt for a moment the greatness of John. He may have some theology off here and there, but don't think for a moment he's not everything that God sent him to be. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. Now, I appreciate how the NIV tries to translate this because this is tricky. Now, this is one of those passages where I believe it becomes evident that Matthew was not written in Greek. I believe the original Matthew was written in Hebrew. Eusebius is a church historian. He tells us that Matthew was written in Hebrew. We have lots of evidence that Matthew was written in Hebrew. And I think the Greek version of Matthew is probably not that original, reliable version because this gets really weird to translate in the Greek. And I'd love to know what Matthew would have chosen in the Greek for this because I think in the Hebrew, Jesus is making a very deliberate play because of a prophecy about the very character he's talking about. This John the Baptist character, the Elijah to come, the forerunner who prepares the way for Messiah. Now, in order to talk about that, I want to jump back to Genesis 38 real quick, because there's a story of Judah and Tamar. 
And you can listen to that story some other time. I'll link resources in the show notes, all that kinds of stuff. But Tamar becomes pregnant with twins. And in Genesis 38, we read the story about Tamar and her twins. And we're told this, When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. As she was giving birth, one of them put out his hand, so the midwife took a scarlet thread and tied it on his wrist and said, This one came out first. So in the Jewish world, it's very, very important when you have twins to know which one is the firstborn. There's going to be all kinds of rights to inheritance and responsibility that's going to be attached to which child was the first child. And so especially if it's the case of identical twins, you have to know which one came out first. So a hand comes out of the womb. They tie a scarlet thread so that they know which one is firstborn. But then that hand goes back inside the womb and the other brother comes bursting forth ahead of the one that just stuck his hand out. And so what happens when... When he, when he drew back his hand, his brother came out and she said, so this is how you have broken out. Now the Hebrew word to break out is paratz, paratz. And so she names him Prats. We say Perez in the English, but she names that child Prez, Prats. And that becomes the line, the lineage, the genealogy that Matthew talks about with Jesus, Jesus comes from that line, that lineage, the lineage of Prats, right? Well, that word shows back up later in Micah chapter 2. And it's a really interesting passage that's relevant here because it's talking about this very character that Jesus is associating with John, right? I'll read it to you. Micah chapter 2, I'm going to start in verse 12. I will surely gather all of you, Jacob. I will surely bring together the remnant of Israel. I will bring them together like sheep in a pen, like a flock in its pasture. The place will throng with people. And the one who breaks, the one who breaks open the way. So Micah talks about this one who's going to break open the way. And the word there is prats. There is this person that's going to come and, and the people of God are shut up in a, pen, uh, in a pen like sheep in a pasture. Now you put, pen, you put sheep in a pen overnight and the morning comes and it's time to go out and get water. It's time to go out and feed. It's, they're getting restless. They're, they're all pushed up against the gate every morning when the sheep get up in the sheep pen. And, and the shepherd is going to, to break open, to prots open the gate and those sheep are going to rush out. There's videos of this happening all over the place on YouTube. The, the sheep prats out. God's people are ready. They're pinned up. They're ready. They're restless. And along comes somebody who's going to prats, break open the way. They will break out. They will prats out the gate and they will go out and their king will pass through before them, the Lord at their head. So those Jews that adhered to the three-part eschatology looked at this passage and they said, okay, what we see here is somebody that comes and breaks open the way and God's people rush out into the, into the, into the kingdom and then the king comes with them and goes out in front of them. And so you have the one that goes before, you have the king itself, and you have the people of God all bursting forth. And I think this is clearly what Jesus is referencing in Matthew 11 when he says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God has been violently, it's been pratsing. John the Baptist is the one that pratsed open the way. And the kingdom of God has been pratsing ever since, Jesus says. Don't think for a moment that John is not everything that God designed him to be because he was here to prats open the way. That's why you're out here in the desert listening Sorry. to people like John. You're out here in the desert listening to people like John because he is pratsing the conversation. He's pratsing the kingdom of God. That's why you're here, Jesus said, because he was a prophet. And he's not just any prophet. He's the one who was protsing open the way. But the kingdom of God, what is our takeaway here? Violent people, prots people, have been raiding it. For the prophets and the law prophesied uh, until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. 
Whoever has ears, let him hear. Jesus says the kingdom of God. What I think one of our biggest takeaways in our lesson today about the kingdom of God is that the kingdom of God is not something that you stumble into. It's not something that you passively, eh, well, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Eh. The kingdom of God is for those that are chomping at the bit, ready to go, ready to prance into the kingdom. Uh, one of my favorite scenes, uh, if you're familiar with the Chosen TV series, one of my favorite scenes is actually in uh, season two, uh, the finale of season two. And Matthew and Jesus, Jesus is preparing the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew's having a conversation. And Matthew's like, Jesus, why do you got to make these teachings so hard? Why do you got to make it so cryptic and so difficult to understand? And Jesus says, I want my disciples to work for it. I'm not looking for passive followers. I love that line from the Jesus character. I'm not looking for passive followers. That's what we see here in this passage. The kingdom of God is for people that are built with the stuff of props. You're not just going to stumble into it. If you want to be a part of the kingdom, you're going to have to resolutely set your mind. You're going to have to be ready and chomping at the bit. And when that gate prots is open, you're going to have to prots out into the kingdom. And then listen to how he closes. To what shall I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace. And calling out to others, we played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. And Jesus quotes here one of Aesop's fables, but there's a lot of background to this fable. Aesop's fables come from a place known as Sardis. And I'll put our lesson on Sardis in the book of Revelation in the description of this video so you can learn more. But Sardis was the homeland for Aesop's fables. And, and Aesop told this fable about this piper, this musician, that could do incredible things when he played his pipe and creation and animals and everything would respond when he played his pipe. And, and there was one time he knew there was, there was an incoming disaster, an incoming disaster, and the seas were going were, were gonna to dry up. And so the piper went out in order to save the fish, and he went out to a boat and he played his pipe trying to get the fish to jump into his boat so that he could save them from the incoming disaster. And the fish said, we know what you're trying to do. You're trying to catch us. We're not going to jump into your boat. And later in the story, as the fish lie dying and gasping for air on the shore after the sea is gone, the piper says, don't look at me. I played a, a song for you and you didn't dance. I played a funeral dirge and you didn't mourn. And the person that Aesop's fables were written in the place called Sardis, a little bit later in history, Cyrus actually came to lay siege on Sardis. Sardis was considered, if you listen to the lesson on Sardis, you can hear more about this. Sardis was considered to be an impenetrable, an invincible fortress that nobody could defeat. But Cyrus was determined to lay siege on Sardis. And so he went looking to all the neighbors saying, will you help me lay siege on Sardis? Will you help me lay siege on Sardis? And everybody went, are you kidding? Sardis is invincible. You will never defeat Sardis. We are not going to help you. Well, Cyrus, if you know anything about history, ended up <laughs> succeeding. And later in the story, when everybody needed Cyrus's help and they came to him looking for help, Cyrus quoted Sardis's own fable. And he said, don't look at me. I played a happy song and you didn't dance. I played a sad song and you didn't mourn. And so Jesus says, what shall I compare this? You're out here listening to John. The kingdom of God is bursting forth right in front of you. And only those that are ready to go are going to see it. But what will I compare this religious generation to? What can I compare this, this group of religious people to? They're like children in the marketplace singing Aesop's fables. And I think what Jesus is getting at, because he doesn't just quote the fable, he says they're like children in the marketplace singing the fable. I think Jesus says, you're even aware of your salvation. You know the story. You can sing the song. You even know the answers. And you don't realize that your impending doom is right on top of you. Your salvation is right under your nose, and you don't even recognize it. That's going to come back, by the way. Let's close off our passage. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. 
Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is right here in, in your midst. It's right under your nose. And whether you package it like John or you package it like Jesus, whether you package it without eating and drinking or whether you eat and drink, what shall I compare this religious generation to? Jesus says you don't, your salvation's right under your nose. You sing about it, you know all about it, and yet you don't even recognize it when it's right in front of you. I bet there are some things we could learn from reflecting on that very lesson ourselves. So many of us religious people, the kingdom of heaven is right in front of it, and we'd rather like, eh, eh, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, let's sing a song. I played a happy song, you didn't dance. I played a sad song, you didn't mourn. And I think Jesus says, it's right under your nose, but only those who are ready to pratz will see it. Would we be people that are ready for the kingdom? Restless, chomping at the bit, ready to go when it shows up, so that when our salvation is at hand, we participate in it. All right, I'll look forward to our next conversation in the next video. Talk to you guys then.